So good to see all of you here. And while they're collecting in the offering, let me remind you of the envelopes out there in the foyer. Um, we have a, a goal of trying to reach $3,000, and that will help fund our uh, events that we have for this year. Uh, the VBS that's right around the corner, the Easter extravaganza that's right around the corner, and all these other wonderful events that you and I get to enjoy. And so as you heard me say on Sunday, if you will kindly leave like the lower amounts, you know, don't go grab a dollar and be like, I got one. You know, let that be for our kids and because um, we have some that have a passion and a burden to want to give and support their local church as well. So, But if you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn with me in the book of Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And, and once again, we're going through this test, uh, a test, the nine different tests that every Christian uh, is going to go through. And there's some that hit harder than others, no doubt. And I believe tonight is one of those nights that uh, it's really a self-reflective test because this test is called the self-will test. Is it all about you or is it all about the Father? Is it all about my accomplishments, my praise? Is it all about me, 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 or is it about him, him, him? And so in Matthew chapter 26, begin reading in verse 36, we read these words. And we know this is the prayer of uh, in the garden. And then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Verse 39 says, and he went a little further and he fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We're going to drop down to verse 42. And he goes a second time and he went away and he prayed and he said, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And we know the third time he prayed in verse 44. And so he left them and he went away again and he prayed the third time saying the same words. We have heard this preached all of our lives. If you've been in church all of your life or if you've been in church at any point, hopefully at some point this passage has been read in church. If not, shame on the preacher. Let me make sure I've said it. <laughs> but we got Christ going into the garden. And so, number one, we understand that prayer is important. If Christ himself is going to go somewhere and pray, you and I need to go and pray. We understand in this passage that not only has he separated himself from those that will uh, be some uh, absorbing of things. You know, you always got those people that... Uh, won't let you get intimate with God. And so sometimes you have to get away. And Christ gets away. And we understand here there are moments that even those that we rely on the most still go to sleep on us. They still aren't always as reliable. And Christ comes not once but twice and saying, Hey, could you not stay awake? Could you not pray with me? But all of that is great, and that's a whole nother sermon. But this self-will test, I want you to look because Jesus never makes it about him. And I'm afraid in the world that you and I live in that there are too many people, even in the church world, that makes it all about them. And so listen, this self-will is simply defined like this. It's just pleasing one's self especially in opposition of the desires of others. 
When it's all about them. Hey, have you ever seen somebody in a relationship and it's always about them? It's never about the person they're dating. It's always about them. I know we just finished out Valentine's, so I hope you made it about your spouse and not about you. If not, we have offers uh, uh, and altars right here that we can pray for you over. But see, here's the thing. Self-willed people is nothing but stubbornness. They, they, they want it their way, and if it don't get their way, they pout. They, they, they've quit jobs over being stubborn. They've, they've broke up marriages because, well, if you're not going to give me this, then I'm gone. Well, it was never going to work as long as you don't humble yourself. Because a relationship, just like a job, just like church, just like serving God, is all about him, never about us. And so we got to get to this place. It would be much like this if I could phrase it this way. You know, uh, I've got two kids, and if I was going through life and I said, me first, you later. That's not about them. It's all about me. And we've heard stories, and we know someone in particular, that, that, that they would eat the food and the kids couldn't eat until the parents ate. Now, I'm sorry, but that's an issue with me. I got enough to last. If it means my kids eating or me eating, the idea is this. We got to quit being so self-consuming. How do I mean that? Well, listen, if, if, if the praise team doesn't sing the song that you want, and all of a sudden you can't worship because they didn't sing out of a red back. That's self-will. That's stubbornness because God says, hey, I'm going to worship. I can worship to a, a rap gospel. I, can, I don't know if there's a such thing as an opera gospel, but if it is, I can worship to that because it's not about the genre of the music. It's about the God that they're trying to praise. The problem is the church can't make the adjustment. And so we don't know if we want to be contemporary or if we want to be traditional. Why? Because it's all about us. And we've had to create multiple services because it's more about us instead of about him. And so here's the problem. I, 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 I've been listening to some podcasts here, and so I've been being convicted while I've been listening. But how we as leaders create the environment in the church tells the guest and God, is it about us or is it about him? Because, see, when we get mad because things didn't go right, if somehow in the middle, you know, we have our format, we've changed it and tweaked it a little bit, but if somehow Sunday we come in and all of a sudden Brother Smoke doesn't open up, but somehow the altars are filled and you get upset because a format has changed and it's just broke up your routine, it's about you. Do you not want people in the altar? We got churches that doesn't want God to move. Why? Because it's about them and being out by 12 o'clock and not about the power of God coming down on them. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. I'm concerned about you. If somehow in the midst of all of this, God has elected to visit his church and somehow we determine it's not in my time schedule. In the moment we say my, listen, this is not, I know sometimes I say that's my church over there. It, because listen, we can't be members of a church. If this church is going to grow, we can't just be members. Like we got to get that. I know we took in four Sunday and praise God for that. But at some point you and I got to become owners of the church. This has to be my church in, in, in the sense of ownership that I want to see it succeed or I want it to die. There's only two places. It can't be status quo. It can't be keep moving. We're either going to own it to die or own it to thrive. And I'm here tonight to tell you that if we're going to die the church, kill the church, then it's about us. Because God's still alive. And so we got to get it to thrive. So let's look at this. In Titus 1 and 7, it says this, For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not giving to wine, not violent, and not greedy for money. At some point, you have to quit being arrogant. 
Now listen, I, you, you know, overbearing and, and self-pleasing. And when I say arrogant, it's like this. I'm super spiritual. Listen, I, and maybe I'm wrong and maybe I'm just on a soapbox tonight because uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm high strung today. I don't know. Got a good sleep in, I guess. But if somehow we come in with this notion that God always speaks to me and never speaks to you, we're arrogant. Because God speaks to everybody that will listen. And it's not always a, a, a loud, audible voice. Can I tell you, I've been serving God a long time. These gray hairs can back that up. I've been in church all my life besides the years that I backslid. And can I tell you, God has never audibly spoke to me. And so for someone to come in and act like God audibly speaks to them all the time, can you tell me when he's coming again? Because I want to hear it. I know that's being a little ridiculous, but that is. But now I have had him speak to me as if it was audible. There was no denying what he said. And the danger of all of this is this, that self-will can bring destruction in one's life into the church, into your family, into your marriage, into your finances. When it becomes all about you, God speaks to me more than he speaks to you. Stop it. This is not a competition. We've made it about us. Listen, I know we're in the Olympics right now, but uh, uh, there's no Olympics in church. There's, we're trying to get everybody to heaven and not send anybody to hell. But the problem is we want to be first. I just want to cross the line. And I take as many of people as I can with me. Because listen, in Proverbs 1 and 32, it says, For turning away of the simple will slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. I don't want to be complacent in serving God. I want to keep moving because I know this, that if I continue to march just a little bit, I'm making ground. I'm moving in the right direction. But we got too many races going on in the church and we got too many things over here. Well, it's this department versus this department. And why can't it be this church? What can I do to help this church be pleasing to God? What can I do to grow this house? What can I do to impact this ministry? What can I do to help the nursery? What can I do to help the praise team or the sound booth or the security team or the youth or the children or men or women? Hey, women, congratulations. You and my wife is like riding cloud nine. Y'all had 21 ladies last night. That's awesome. And I'm, I'm jealous. I'll tell you, I'm jealous. And, and, and so one day we're, we're going to beat that number. I know we just said we're not in competition, but, you know. That's, y'all just really set the bar. You know, we're, you know, that's, you know, so. But listen, if we're not careful, well, ain't that many coming to the men. And we'll get our feelings hurt. And we'll reduce the number because we'll leave the church. Oh, we'll quit attending until, well, I'll start attending when the numbers pick back up. Well, maybe you're the missing link. And the problem is somehow we think we're God's greatest gift to mankind. And, and, and here's the problem in the church. Listen, in Nehemiah 9, verse 16, it says this, but they and or, or our fathers act proudly. They've hardened their necks and did not heed your commandments. Why? Because pride produces limitations. I can't do that. If we were to ask you today, hey, listen, can you go scrub the toilets? And you're like, no, that's, I, I can't do that. Like, that's not me. At some point, you have to understand, listen, if that's what I need to do to make God's house uh, 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 pleasing to him, then give me whatever I need to do. You know, I know Sister Woman, she makes a joke sometimes about me being the, the maintenance person here. And, you know, I text Brother Brad today and say, hey, I changed three light bulbs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we've had ladies come and say, hey, listen, Pastor, the toilet's not working. I, I don't sit there and say, oh, who can I get to go fix it? Because at some point, you, you, you want to do all you can for God. It's never about me. 
it's not below me. I, I flew all the way out to, to Guatemala and stuck my hand in the sewers of Guatemala to fix an orphanage. Why? Because it's not about me. Now, I didn't like what the other people were doing. You know, they weren't doing nothing but snapping photos. I'm like, well, you come to work. I come to work. You know, I'm like, Brother Gary, I ain't going to show up to work now. Why? Because it's not about me. It's about them. Amen. And when I come to this house every Sunday and Sunday night and Wednesdays, it's all about him. What can I do to give him praise? And this is why I think we need to get back to coming into the house of God with a spirit of expectation. God, if I'm the missing link, if I'm the key to the service, then hey, great. I'm ready to do whatever I got to do, but I got to listen to his voice. I can't be prideful. So if God says, listen, I know, you know, some people probably don't understand. If God says, I want you to do a Jericho march. I know some people that I ain't marching around. You know, and they'll question God, and we've been there. We, we got, hey, you know, I want you to go over there and lay hands and pray on that person. I'm not doing that. They might think I'm crazy. I think you're crazy for not doing it. How do you ignore the command or the unction or, or the uh, conviction of God? The problem is this. Why? Because there's pride in the heart. We, we want to do our thing because it's, it's not high enough. Oh, I, I, you, you know, God, if you'll give me this. And so we look at the, the story in the Bible where the, the, I need you to go dip seven times in the Jordan River. He gets mad. And what did the, the person with him say? If he would have asked you to do something hard, you'd have done it. But because you didn't think you were that low, I'm not dipping that low. But sometimes God puts us in positions to see if I make you down here, will you still be faithful? Because if you'll be obedient right here when nobody else is looking, then God knows that he can trust you when people are looking. Because see, in Proverbs 16 and 18, it says this, and you know this, that pride goeth before destruction. And a hearty spirit before the fall. See, here's the problem. Pride blinds people's weaknesses. When we have pride, we don't look at our weaknesses, we look at others' weaknesses. Because somehow, it, it, it's almost as if we're injecting ourselves with steroids because we're trying to pump us up, but in the process, every time you pump you up, you're deflating somebody. And I would much rather, God, hey God, I want you to bless them because I have been more blessed, if that's if proper English, I, I have been blessed beyond measure watching somebody else get blessed and God says, okay, because you put them before you, I'm going to bless you as well. Why? Because God says in his word that we're to prefer our brothers and sisters before ourselves. The problem is that's not society thinking. And so now we're living in a world of what is PR? What does the PR say? Well, I don't care what the PR says. I don't want to be politically correct. I want to be the gospel correct. I want to be found pleasing to God because pride keeps us from seeking help. I'm going to let that sit in. Because pride keeps us from asking because we're afraid of what somebody's going to think. And I can't tell you how many have come into my office, you know, uh, trying to slide under the radar. Listen, help is available for those that ask it. And Jesus, now let's, let's go to the word. Everything's founded on the word. What does he say? You have not because you ask not. And so how do we, nobody, my wife told me this when we first got married, you know, and she tells every woman when they, in the uh, premarital counseling class, listen, men are not mind readers. Women ain't either, but, you, you know, uh, don't think they know. And we go through life thinking somehow somebody's got to see me struggling. Somebody's got to see that I'm hurting. Somebody's got to see that I, I'm not having a whole lot of money in my pocket. Somebody's got to see this and got to see this. And at the end of the day, nobody's got to see anything. 
Because a lot of times when we come and ask, hey, Sister Patricia, how you doing? I'm good. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Isn't that what, you know? We deceive those that are really having our best interest in mind. If she was to say, Pastor, I'm not doing very well. I know that I can add her to the list. Hey, is there anything that we can help you with? And so sometimes it's not you always verbalizing, I need help with this. Pastor, can you give me $1,000? Can you help me with this? Can... But it's just saying, I'm struggling. You don't have to tell me what you're struggling with. God knows. And see, here's the problem. If God's all-knowing and we all believe he is, then why do we hide the fact that we struggle? Because society has said you're weak. If I can see a kink in your armor, society says that's the weakest link. That's where you need to attack and expose that. The problem is the church is supposed to be the armor so that when the enemy comes against those that are weak, I'm struggling over here, I'm having a bad day, we as the church surround them and say, you're weak right now, but I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to carry you. Why? Because I'm not going to allow pride to destroy you. And too many ministers have fallen from a pulpit. Because of pride. See, pride keeps us from making men's with people. I'm not. They hurt me. I'm not, I'm not going first. And whether it's your spouse, your children, whether it's somebody in church, pride has kept us from saying two words. I'm sorry. Listen, I, I'm preaching to the choir because if you were to ask the question in my house, who says I'm sorry more, my wife or me, you saw her. She raised her hand. <laughs> and it's not to say that she makes more mistakes. It's just she's quicker to say I'm sorry than I am. Now, I will come in with a different phrase, you know, because the society that we lived in or live in, it's not like we've exited a society yet, has said, oh, any time that you admit you're wrong, you're weak. So let's put the, the relationship in the balance. If I don't admit I'm wrong, I damage the relationship. Because now there's animosity. There's lack of relationship. There's lack of, of communication because, well, you know, until he, you know, until he admits he's wrong, I'm, I'm not getting over this. Men have their nothing box. We have this nothing area. Like, hey, what, what's going on? Where you been? You know, if we go ask somebody, well, what you thinking about? Nothing. And for a woman, she can't understand that. And listen, I am not dogging women, okay? It's scientifically studied, okay? If you got an issue, take it up with God. But here's the thing. For us, we, we can compartmentalize. Men can compartmentalize and keep going. We'll deal with it later. We'll come back around. It'll make full circle. We'll come back around. But for a woman, she's got to process the emotion of it. She's got to process all the details of it. And then she might get beyond it. It didn't take time. But if we're not careful here, the, the other part of pride. See, pride causes us to blame others for our mistakes. Eve blamed the serpent. Adam blamed the woman. At some point, you and I need to quit being so self-willed and say, hey, listen, it's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I need God. I need you to help me. Why? Because I'm, I'm about to mess somebody up right here. I might need to turn my back, but now y'all might stab me, so let me not do that. A self-willed person can't be trusted. Period. If it's all about you, you can't be trusted. Because how do we know that you care about the team? How do we know that you care about the good of the whole? See, a person that can't be trusted can't be used. I can't use a person in church that can't be trusted. I'm not going to put somebody up here that I don't have some trust in 
because if I'm not careful, they'll violate the, the atmosphere that you try to build. And trust is a big thing. See, a self-willed person that can't be used can't be promoted. I'm not saying they, they don't get promoted. I'm just saying that they shouldn't be promoted because the problem is in the eyes of everybody, it is appearing as if we're appreciating bad behavior. It's much like, in, I don't, listen, I'm just, this is another soapbox, y'all. I got a bunch of them right now. I don't, we don't do participation trophies. When I was growing up, either you come in first place or you didn't get something. One, two, three. Here you go. The fourth place didn't get nothing. But now we, we want to build people up. But what we're doing is we're encouraging this self-willed. It's all about me. I should be at least recognized. If I fail, I should be recognized as the second loser at least. But at least I got recognized. And so the society that we build is, it's about me. You need to be more concerned about my feelings. Well, sometimes you're not concerned about mine. And so we, it's got to go both ways. But watch this. A person that can't be promoted is always focused on them. Hey, what do you think we should do? I don't know what I should do. And phrasing and wording is everything. And so in the church, listen, I know we got a leadership meeting coming on Sunday, and and we're going to talk about the church. We're going to talk about what can we as a church do to be better. And it's not, well, this department needs to do this and this. No, it's about the whole. Because, listen, this limb is still connected to the body. These fingers are still connected to the body. And so it's not about, well, my department's doing great. Listen, I'll just squash all that. There ain't one department in here doing better than another department. Me included. Like this preaching is my department, I guess. Because at the end of the day, we all got places that we can expand and grow and and get deeper in God. Why am I saying that? Because 2 Kings 17 and 14 says this. Nevertheless, they would not hear. But they stiffened their necks like the necks of their father who did not believe in the Lord their God. We are setting a legacy to pass on to the next generation. And that legacy is this, that self-willed people produce steams of unbelief. So when we're trying to do something in the moment... An individual, let's uh, well, just use me as a pastor since I'm, I'm up here. If I say, I think we're going to change these lights today. And a self-willed person can undermine the authority of the pastor or the direction of a church. Well, I think we need to do it tomorrow. I'm going to do this tomorrow. You don't have to worry about it. And the problem is you put too much responsibility. Yes, I see you. You put too much responsibility on yourself. This is a team effort. And if we're not careful, then all of a sudden we have the wrong type of ownership in the church. Because now it's the church boss. Now it's this or that. And so let me help you. A self-willed person does a couple of things. I'm going to give you five real quick. Number one, they refuse to listen to God. Because they think they know better. And a self-willed person, when it's all about them... It's, I'm not listening to God. I I got it figured out. Number two, a self-willed person refuses to submit to authority. Because it's all about me. Like, you're not going to be better than me. You're not going to be over me. And if you've ever been in a workforce, we see that all the time. They're not committed. You can't tell me I can't have the day off. I, you know, and they're not worried about the, the health of the overall job. They're worried about them. Number three, a a self-willed person exhibits this. They fail in abiding by the instructions. They don't want instructions because I got this. I can do this. And I'm sure, ladies, you know this about us men. If you give us something and here's the instructions, I got this. I'm not sure why I got 14 pieces left over, but I got this. 
And then when your child's riding down the road and the wheel falls off, and then you're like, well, maybe I should have listened. And the problem is we only listen when our world's falling apart. Why can't we listen on the front end? And if we'll listen on the front end, God says, I'll spare you some heartache on the back end. Number five, a self-willed person refuses to receive correction. How dare you tell me? And the problem with failing to receive correction is, see, God always corrects us. It's called conviction. When we're doing wrong, God begins to speak to us. God begins to help. And this last one, a refusal to sacrifice for others. They're not going to sacrifice for anybody else. If it was, I don't know, um, try to think of a good example, but somebody can't make the nursery rotation. And all of a sudden, Sister Jenny comes up and says, hey, I know you're scheduled for next week. Can you help this week? It ain't my week. I got next week. I wasn't planning on doing this week. And they'd never consider sacrificing for the well-being of the operation. And listen, I... I, I'm just, I'm not pinpointing anybody, okay? I'm not saying that even happens here. I'm trying to use examples that we can relate with. Because let me help you recognize a self-willed person. See, God asks us to do something that's always contrary to our desires. When God tells you, I need you to give this up, there's a reason because you've gotten too much attachment to it. And he understands that, listen, I'm going to see if you'll sacrifice for the sake of others. Because every time God asks you to give up something, it's to push you to another level. He's got a blessing in store. He asks the rich young ruler to go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And your treasures will be laid up in heaven. The problem is he was enjoying counting the physical blessing more than the spiritual. And the sacrifice that you and I do is just that. Abraham offered Isaac on an altar. Why? Because it wasn't about me and my promise and my son. It was you stay here. We're going to go up there and we're going to come back. Abraham believed that, hey, listen, I may have to kill my son, but God's going to raise him up. Why? Because it was not about him. Jonah went to preach in Nineveh. Now, I know he went the other way. But see, Jonah, when he finally began to preach and they turned, it was, he got mad. And sometimes, even when you do what you're supposed to do, we still get mad. Why? Because we didn't want it to be done. He didn't want them to get saved. How do we not want anybody to get saved? Pastor, I don't mind us going and preaching to the homeless, but I don't want none of them in my church. That's the wrong attitude. And so listen, you know, Naaman already talked about him, but he went and I'm not dipping in that dirty water seven times. We got better streams. Oh, man, we got the Bermuda clear water. If he'd have said, just go right there, that would have been great. But sometimes you got to get a little dirty for Christ to be clean in your heart. You got to go down and get scrubbed around and understand that there are some things. The reason God's asking you to do that is to stretch us. But if it's all about me and never about him, I'm always going to fail the test. See, Peter failed. And not just with betraying Jesus, you're going to betray me. Oh, no, I'm not. But even at the moment when he said, cast the net to the other side. Now, his first response was not, absolutely, Lord. You say it, I do it. He was not that spiritual. What did he say? We've been toiling all night. We ain't caught a thing. So he's questioning at the beginning, but then he understands. And this is where you and I have to get. That even when we don't understand why you're asking me to do it, I'm still going to be obedient. And so his next response was, nevertheless, we'll do it. Paraphrasing. 
Nevertheless, we'll throw the nets to the other side. And they received from the Lord. And not just that. Listen, Christ himself in the garden, we just read about it. And, 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 and Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. He's trying to get out of it. Who wants to die? Nobody just wants to die. Listen, I love my family. I don't want to die. But if it comes to it, I want to die. If it means that they can live. And Christ understood, hey, listen, I'm the, the human side says, I don't want to die. I know what's entailed on this. I know what the brutality is going to entail. I know that, but nevertheless, Lord, not my will, not my will, but yours be done. And at some point, we need to walk through life that way. God, not my will, but yours. Because when it's all about him, it does something. It reveals our true person. See, you can, Joey can come in here and, and act all spiritual, and he can come in here and act all friendly. But when the test comes, it reveals whether that's a facade or whether it's real. Hey, I need you to go over here and shake this person. I ain't getting out of my seat. If they want to shake my hand, I come over here. Well, that tells me you might need an encounter. Because sometimes we do need to get out and go shake the person's hand over here and let them know you're worth my journey. I could have stayed where I'm at. But I didn't. I've been in here plenty of times, come up here to the front and spoke with Brother Smoke. And all of a sudden, here come Brother Brad. He get up and come shake my hand. Why? Because the encounterment says you're worth my journey. And we need to do that when guests come into this house that it's not about me. Listen, nobody's got a name on these seats. But too often, we claim it. And what happened if we were to come in here next Sunday and there was no pews in here? Would you still sit and, you know, still stand right in your same spot? Or would you be like, well, I might as well change now because I don't know where I'm going to sit. And the problem is we get too attached to things. And all I'm asking for you and I to do is to be flexible as God tries to stretch us. Because a self-willed person is so stuck on themselves and God injects you into their life. And, and we get frustrated with them because they're mistreating us. But God says, I need you to show them love. I need you to show them what it means not to be so stuck. Listen, I, I know that song, Stuck on You. It, you, know, I, you know, that's a great song. But we can't be so stuck on ourselves. That when God says, I need you to go, that you don't want to go. Listen, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 20, it says this. For I fear least when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions, jealousy, outburst of wrath, self, backbiting, whispering, conceit, now, that doesn't happen in church, right? Most church issues are because somebody was stuck on them. That somebody thought they were right. When's the last time that you seen a church issue and the whole body said, we're not going to divide, we're going to go in prayer? When's the last time there was an issue in the church and all of a sudden everybody says, stop! Let's go to the altar and pray and let God determine the outcome. The reason we don't now, that used to happen in the old churches, but the reason we don't now is, number one, we don't want to take the time. Number two, we don't want God to expose whether or not we're right or wrong. And three, we just don't want to be with them. I mean, family reunions. Or who's coming? I know y'all don't have that. You know, like, who's coming? You know, who's invited? Uh, I'll come if so-and-so ain't coming. What are you saying? It's about me. It's about me. Listen, I want us to live our life with no regrets. And sometimes we're going to have to cross the line that we never wanted to cross and say at the end of the day, my issue 
is not going to get me. I'm going to conquer my issue. Why? Because, listen, in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart that I will ascend into heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And I will also sit on the mount, the congregation of the furthest sides of the north, and I will ascend upon the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. If we're not careful, we will find us. Now I want you to... Follow me. We'll find ourselves transitioning from an angel position to a devil position. And what I mean by that is you're going to lose the satisfaction of connecting with people. And it's all going to be anger and bitterness and resentment. See, the devil doesn't want you to be happy. Self-willed people are not happy. They're miserable, but they feed off of others coming in and walking on eggshells and coming in and saying, well, we better please them because we don't want to deal with the wrath. And so we're trying to, uh, we're trying to satisfy this self-willed person. And the problem is we're creating an atmosphere of destruction. And we need to pray for them. We need to walk with them because, listen, a self-willed test reveals the level of one submission unto God. So when God comes, listen, everyone must answer to someone. In this church, you know it, we, we, I am not the ultimate authority. I am of authority, but at the end of the day, if you wanted to get rid of me, all you got to do is call Pastor Mark and say, we want him gone. Y'all can vote, and if the outnumbered ways, I'm out of here. Why? Because... I have to answer to somebody. I have to answer to Pastor Mark. Pastor Mark has to answer to the state overseer. The state overseer has to answer to the general overseer. Listen, we all answer to somebody, but at the end of the day, we also have to answer to God. And so I want God to look at me that when I stand before him at the judgment, I want him to open up the book and not declare that you were self-willed. But he will say, I, I saw the the humbleness in your heart. I saw that you preferred others before yourself. I saw that you had the heart of me and you wanted my people to grow and you took care of your family before you took care of yourself. Listen, we got to get back to that place. My wife will tell you, I got, I got spoiled people in my house. She says I spoiled the kids. I think, you know, she started it and I finished it. I'm just kidding. But I put myself last, whether it's to my kids or whether it's to my wife, because at the end of the day, if they're happy, I'm okay. But if it ever comes to a place to where I elevate me before them, there's going to be misery in the home. Why? Because life is full of people that will always tell you what to do. I'm always going to have a boss, and I ain't talking about my wife being the boss. I'm saying I'm always going to have a boss. You're always going to have a boss. Somebody's always going to dictate some things, and if we're not careful, we'll allow that to destroy us, and then we take it out on those around us. When those around us is building us our character, and they're giving us opportunity to serve them, because if everyone only did what they wish, chaos would be right around the corner. How do you know that, preacher? Because we live in a chaotic world. We can't tell nobody they're wrong because that will hurt their feelings. Listen, we don't need life coaches on the street when somebody's robbing a bank. How, could you hold on a minute? Let, let's talk about why you would get to this place. We don't have time for that. They broke the law, take them to jail. The problem in all of this is that we feel like we're entitled to something. And the church has fed into it. Because now a preacher doesn't want to preach strong messages because he's afraid he's going to lose a tithe giver. 
This is God's house, and we could come down to just me and my wife being here, and somehow, some way, God will take care of his house. Why? Because if I do what God's asked me to do, God will provide. And so watch this as I try to hurry up. A self-willed person is the opposite of submission. A self-willed person is not going to submit. See, the Bible talks to you and I about submission. Look, in 1 Peter 5 and 5, it says that the younger shall submit to the elders. In Hebrews 13 and 17, it says, Obey them that are in ruler over you and submit yourselves. We know the Bible is full of submissions. In Colossians 3 and 18, wives, submit to your husbands. James 4 and 7, submit yourselves to God. And we could go down this whole list. Submission, submission, submission. In 1 Peter 5 and 5, be subject one to another. Why? Accountability matters. See, the self-will screens out who is a good leader And who is an authoritative seeker? Because if all you're looking for is the pats on the back, you're not going to be a good leader. Because a good leader sometimes has to crawl in the foxhole with his people and fight the fight beside of them, take the rank off and lock arms and say, we're in this together. A leader will fall if he's all about him. Look in scripture. David was supposed to go to battle. Instead, I don't need to go this time. It become all about him. But see, when you refuse to engage what you're supposed to, watch this, you transfer the leadership from one person to the next. Somebody has to fill the gap when the self-willed person thinks, I don't need to do that. And they begin to lose their authoritativeness. They begin to lose, and here's the more better word I want to use, they begin to lose their influence. Because now they think they're better or bigger than the game. So let me finish with this. In Jude chapter 1 verse 16. It says, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust, that they may mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, verse 17, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. Verse 19. These are sensual people who cause divisions not having the spirit. The self-willed person is going to cause chaos. They're going to be grumblers and complainers. Why? Because they're not getting their way. And today, listen, today should not be, how do I get my way? How do I get recognized? Because everyone's going to encounter a moment of you having to decide, will I submit? Or will I damage? Because when we fail to submit, damage occurs. Listen, I know we want to preach, oh, wives are supposed to submit to their husbands. And my wife will gladly submit to me. If I model submission to her, if I submit myself to God and love her as Christ loved the church and gave my life for her, she has no problem. How do we want to grow the church? I want to grow the church by them seeing us lead the way that it's not about us. There's a world out there that's dying and going to hell. And if all we care about is those that feel these four walls, we have missed ministry. Because people need to see that it's not about us. It's not a denominational thing. It's not a color thing. It's not a money thing. It's not a a, a woman thing, a man thing, a boy girl. It's not any of that. It's a God thing. And what role are we playing in edifying God? That is the test. Would you bow your hands? Father, today we thank you. Lord, I know there are times that we're challenged. At times we're challenged to whether or not we're going to submit to the ways of you. We're challenged growing up as children of 
whether we'll submit to the ways of our father, our mother. In the moments that we get out of line, there's a rod of correction waiting. It's not to harm us, but to show us the way. To let us know that there are moments in our lives that what we think is right is wrong. And in the midst of trying to have it all about us, we hurt people. We put our feelings before others, our ways before others' ways. And that has transpired into us not always following your way. And yet, at the end of the time when we've exhausted all means, we come back hollering, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. But God, I pray today that things are changing. I pray today, God, that we as a congregation would rise up and say, I need help. That we would rise up and instead of it being all about me, could come into this house and be able to say, what can I do for you? How can I help you? Where can I serve that, that will make the best impact? Because at the end of the day, Lord, I'm not looking for glitz, glamour, or fame but I'm just looking at making a difference in somebody's life because you made a difference in mine. So, Lord, would you give us a passion for the lost? Would you give us a passion for one another that if there's any division in this house, if there's anything that is causing division or hardship, if there's anything that's causing your will from moving forward, Lord, would you bring it to our attention that we can get it covered and get it worked out before it destroys. We want to maintain the lighthouse. And we know that there are people that you're bringing this way every day. They're one step closer to walking through these doors. And Lord, and we know that it's going to not be about us. But what can we do to point others to you? So help us, touch us. Let us be the example that others want to follow, not because of the fortunes that you bring our way, but for the cross that we all can carry together. In your name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Don't forget the envelopes are out in the foyer. There's also... Uh, this Sunday, don't forget the leadership. That's for everyone that works in the church. We'll see you at 430. God bless you.